Um, hello and welcome to another Tenderloin Museum online events. My name is Katie Connery and I'm the Executive Director of the Tenderloin Museum. The museum opened in 2015 with the mission of uncovering the lost history of the Tenderloin as well as celebrating the vibrant present day community. And we do this through historical exhibitions, an art gallery, walking tours, and weekly public programs. And we're currently open 10 to 5, Tuesday through Saturday, with walking tours of the neighborhood at 1 p.m. every Saturday. So please come see us. And we're very excited tonight to be shining a light on Jeff Adachi's new book, The Case of San Francisco Public Defender Frank Geegan. Ah! <laughs> There we go. <laughs> a murder and Scandal in the 1930s, which details a fascinating chapter in San Francisco history. And Jeff Adachi was a fierce advocate who protected and championed San Francisco's most vulnerable communities. And he was also a talented filmmaker and writer. And tonight we'll be celebrating his legacy in public service as well as his creative legacy. And thanks so much to the San Francisco Public Defender's Office for all the incredible work that you do and for your partnership with us on this event. We are thrilled to be part of your 100 year anniversary celebration. And tonight we are honored to welcome Jeff's wife, Matsuko Adachi. And thank you so much for taking the time to be part of this event. And we welcome two of Jeff's longtime friends and colleagues at the SF Public Defender's Office, Chief Attorney Matt Gonzalez and Growth and Development Training Director Jaku Wilson. So um, Matsuko is going to kick off the evening and then Jaku will give an overview of the truly wild Frank Egan case. And Matt Gonzalez is going to then speak to Jeff's legacy um, at the SF Public Defender's Office. Then we'll have a screening of The Ride, which is a 15 minute film, one of Jeff's many films, um, one that's been released recently. And then we'll have time, hopefully at the end, for, for a Q&A. So let us know if you have any questions, get those in the Q&A field. Um, so without further ado, here is Matsuko Adachi. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say a few words. Um, first, I just want to say Jeff was a true Renaissance man. He was an author. He was um, a Barbary Bar Review teacher, a documentary filmmaker, community act uh, activist, but most of all, he was a father, a husband, and a public defender. He loved being a trial attorney, and he would always say, I want an office of fighters, great public defenders, not public pretenders. And um, the Frank Egan book was his eighth book, and he wrote it late at night after Lauren and I went to bed. The book means a lot to me since he finished it right before he passed away. Um, I wanna thank, thank you very much to the Tenderloin Museum and the San Francisco Public Defender's Office for hosting this event and honoring Jeff. Um, he would be thrilled. Um, I miss Jeff a lot and um, it's tough. I know as well as many of you do too, but um, I'd like to thank everybody for um, attending and thank you very much for the event. You. Thank you, I appreciate it. And uh, again, a big thanks to you for being here today. I know it's tough. Uh, it's been a little over two years. Um, the other uh, thing that we're celebrating today in addition to Jeff is the 100 year anniversary of the Public Defender's Office. Um, you know, Jeff's commitment to justice, uh, San Francisco and then the Public Defenders as a whole uh, is unquestioned. Um, it was an honor and still is an honor thinking about the time that I worked alongside Jeff for all those years in his relentless pursuit of justice. Um, not only was Jeff an educator, um, but he was also someone who really believed in what he uh, tried to show folks was the uh, criminal injustice system. And he said the system is working the way that it was intended to work. Uh, through his books, movies, and advocacy, he was always teaching. Uh, for example, in the book, uh, the Frank Ingham book, uh, at page 15, uh, he talks about the position of the uh, public defender was created by the Holtz Defender 
bill, an effort by California's first female lawyer, Claire Foltz, who spent over 25 years advocating for a public defender's office. The bill finally passed the state legislature in 1921, and the creation of the San Francisco Public Defender's Office was approved by the Board of Supervisors that same year. Egan was then appointed to public defender by the mayor, and there was a San Francisco Chronicle uh, article, October 1921, uh, that went into detail about that. Um, additionally, uh, in his remarks, when uh, the office was uh, newly formed um, at the swearing in, Frank Egan said, the mission of this office is it will be our effort to give the poor man charged with crime the best legal aid that is in our power to give, Egan said. Uh, he asserted that the San Francisco had a long been in need of such an office and pledged that America's promise of liberty for all would now be possible under the auspices of this office. Uh, Egan was given two offices at the Hall of Justice, but no staff. Uh, like many public defenders, he was overworked. <laughs> Uh, the first case he was assigned was the case of Dell Patterson, who, according to the Chronicle, uh, was charged with an unspecified felony. Uh, in his first nine months in office, Egan would take on 316 cases, making 1,278 court appearances himself. He must have never slept. Handling cases from larceny to burglary, he had a fine reputation as a trial attorney winning 38 acquittals uh, in his first year in office. You know, Frank Egan's history uh, is forever entwined with our office, uh, as well as the uh, legacy of the public defender's office. Why? Because he was the first public defender. And as we all know now, he was also charged uh, with murder. Uh, a little bit about Frank Egan as well is that uh, prior to becoming uh, the public defender, Frank Egan was a, a police officer. Um, and so uh, he was, you know, and that's, that doesn't happen too often. I've never heard of it, um, but a, a public defender who was a former police officer. So that was something uh, interesting to learn about uh, Frank Egan as well. Um, folks said that he was a man about town, that he was impeccably dressed. Um, and Jeff covered this case extensively. But the way that Jeff put the book together uh, was by reading old newspaper clippings. Um, and he would do that by going to the San Francisco uh, library and pulling up old uh, archives. I believe they're called microfiche. And a lot of folks today don't know what that is, but that was this old system where um, you could look at uh, old newspaper clippings. It was prior to LexisNexis and all these other um, new technologies that we have. Uh, there were no trial transcripts. Um, and so Jeff recreated this book, as I indicated, uh, solely by uh, doing his own research uh, and analysis of uh, prior newspaper articles, et cetera. Uh, and there was such a media frenzy about this case. I think there was something about 50 or more reporters covering this case at uh, any time. Um, and that's unheard of today. Now you only have a few uh, reporters who are covering a case, unless it's uh, Matt Gonzalez and uh, the uh, Garcia Cerate case. But uh, nowadays, uh, you only have a couple of uh, reporters uh, who cover these cases. Um, the first half of the book um, covers uh, the you know story of Frank Egan, um, some of the players in the book. Um, it also goes through the uh, investigation. Um, it almost reads like a uh, old or like a law and order type um, series where at first there's the investigation and then there's the trial or like a, a Perry Mason show where in the beginning, the first half is uh, the investigation and then the uh, second half is the, uh, the trial. Um, but basically um, what happens is that uh, Miss Hughes is found dead in the street. And it was what was supposed to be a hit and run. And the investigation that followed, uh, Frank Egan was charged with murder. The DA said that Frank Egan's uh, motive was that he knew uh, Mrs. Hughes 
and that uh, he had mounting debt uh, and that he killed Miss Hughes for money. Uh, it probably didn't help that uh, Frank Egan was the beneficiary on a couple of the life insurance policies uh, that Miss Hughes had. Um, some of the players uh, in this uh, book are uh, Captain Galea, and I may be getting his, his name wrong, um, but he was what was described as a, a cop's cop, uh, a San Franciscan native. Uh, he was born in um, 1889, seven years after Egan. Um, he was formerly in the uh, Marines, um, and he had been a police officer and a detective, uh, then was promoted to captain uh, at the time of this case. And at this time, there were a lot of murders going on in San Francisco uh, when this case uh, landed on uh, his desk. Um, and one of the interesting things is, is that um, the book covers the whole case. And then at the end, uh, they talk about um, the wiretaps. Um, and so what is clear at, at some point when, when you read the book is that a lot of the folks who were investigating this case already had formed opinions and that information had not been disclosed uh, during the trial. And we can come, we'll cover that again in, in, in a few moments. Um, but other folks uh, who played pivotal roles in, in this uh, drama uh, were um, Vincent Hallinan, uh, he was described as a, a lion in the court. Um, he was described as the defender's defender. Uh, there's a photo of him here uh, when he was held in contempt of court uh, and jailed uh, for representing uh, his client, uh, Frank Egan. Uh, and that's what the caption on this photo uh, says, is uh, that he was the defender's defender uh, jail for contempt. Um, he, again, like I said, was described as a lion in the court. Uh, he uh, went on to represent a lot of labor union folks, um, a lot of other cases, uh, and his legacy and his name and his family are forever entwined in San Francisco's rich uh, history. And we'll cover him again in a few moments. Uh, the DA in the case was uh, Isidero Golton. Um, he was kind of described as like, a, I guess, a straight shooter. Um, there wasn't a lot of finaz about him, but the reality is, is that, uh, again, when we talk about the, the wiretap and all that other information, uh, he knew that information prior to the case going to trial, uh, and we learn about that after the fact. Um, and so uh, I don't know how much of a straight shooter you can be described of uh, if you're withholding information, but I guess in those days, that is what a straight shooter is. Um, but uh, he gave, uh, it, it, to all accounts, uh, uh, um, you know, a, a trial uh, in which, um, you know, he did a, a fantastic job according to the, the reports. Um, the other uh, players in the, the movie and in the, in the drama were Albert Tennant uh, and, and Vern Dorn. Um, those individuals uh, were formerly represented by Frank Egan. Uh, they were also members of the uh, Public Defender's Office. They both had uh, prior uh, felony convictions. Uh, Albert Tennan um, and uh, Vern Dornan uh, were the ones who went into uh, Mrs. Hughes' house. Uh, it is inside of the house where uh, Miss Hughes in the garage uh, was hit over the head a few times and by Albert Tennan knocked unconscious and then uh, Frank Dorn, um, uh, Vern Dorn uh, actually drove over her with the car um, and then they uh, put her in the car and threw her body out into the street and for their purposes thought that it appeared to be a hit and run. Um, the other person in this was Jesse Hughes. Uh, Jesse Hughes was, was, was a widower um, she was a lady up in age. Uh, she lived alone. Uh, she uh, had financial dealings with uh, Frank Egan. Um, it was alleged that she was taking, or that Frank Egan was taking money from her um, and things went sour. Uh, then she ended up dead. 
Um, what's also interesting about this is that Captain DeLua uh, had written letters to her indicating that Frank Egan may uh, be wanting to harm her, uh, but yet she was still harmed. So the police knew about this and still uh, it happened. Um, one of the other things that I, I find uh, interesting other than, those are like the main players other than Judge Dunn. Uh, judge Dunn uh, had been uh, a judge for decades. Uh, he had handled many high profile cases. Um, and uh, he was the one who oversaw this case. Uh, him and uh, Vincent Hallinan routinely got into it. Um, and uh, that was why uh, Vincent Hallinan was uh, ultimately thrown in to jail and, and held in contempt. Of interesting, some other interesting notes. I, I have a few more minute, minutes, so I want to just uh, bring up a few interesting facts. Um, in uh, discovery at that time, um, nowadays we have reciprocal discovery. The district attorney is required to turn over to the defense Brady information that's exculpatory information. Um, at this time, no side was required to tell the other side what witnesses they intended to call or what evidence they would offer. Uh, the state kept their witnesses secret from the defense and the defense did the same. Uh, and even in this case, even after um, Doran had confessed, they didn't even have to turn that statement over to the defense. It wasn't until I believe the trial uh, that they ultimately were able to get the uh, confession other than it being a lot of it published in the paper in part. Um, you know, one of the interesting uh, other things that I found about uh, the, the book is that um, back then, uh, the case went to trial really quick. Uh, it happened 13 weeks after the murder. Um, that was really quick. At that time in San Francisco, uh, it was a death penalty case. Um, now San Francisco uh, does not have the death penalty. Um, however, at the time of this trial, uh, it was a death penalty case although when the jury did convict uh, Mr. Egan, uh, they did not recommend death. Um, another interesting thing, and I, I'll, I'll wrap up here, is that in jury selection, the background, photos, and addresses as, of each of the jurors were published in detail in the papers. That obviously doesn't happen anymore. Um, another thing is, is that the defense reserved opening, uh, that typically doesn't happen. Uh, typically, in the beginning of a jury trial, there's jury selection, the DA opens, the defense opens. In this case, they reserved opening. Uh, additionally, uh, the uh, defense had said that Frank Egan wasn't gonna take the stand. Ultimately he did, and that caught the district attorney by a huge surprise. Um, I know I'm running out of time, um, but one of the other things that I will mention is that uh, the jury in this case, uh, deliberated for uh, 58 and a half hours. Uh, and that set a new record at that time for a murder trial uh, because no other trial had gone longer uh, than 24 hours. And I'm running out, of, I, I went over, so I will turn it over uh, to Matt now and then I can always come back later and cover any other talks. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jaku. And it's great to see Mutsko. And thank you to Alex and Katie, both of you for being uh, Host for this event. You know, um, when I reflect on this book, and, you know, I start to think about Jeff's interest in the book. Obviously, since he was the elected public defender, he was drawn to Frank Egan's story. And as Jaku noted, it was a, a complicated story because he's sort of the first public defender, and yet he went to San Quentin for uh, murder. And it's not typically your origin story, if you know what I mean, particularly in our line of work. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's odd when the public defender gets put on trial. I think Jeff was also drawn to this story because it had all these sub narratives that still resonate today. Jaku got into a little bit things about the obligation to turn over discovery is an ongoing battle that we still wage. 
there were personalities um, that were part of this drama who literally not just Hallinan, but their relatives of some of the police inspectors that worked on the case and even Egan's own family that still reside in the area. And there's a lot just about the history of San Francisco and that era of life. Uh, for instance, we don't think about it, but um, as Egan was trying to build an alibi or the prosecutor was trying to discount Egan's alibi, there were literally members of the public that could step forward and say, oh, on that date, I saw Egan walking out of a garage or I saw him catching a car over here. Uh, he was a, a well-known enough figure in San Francisco that people that did not know him had reason to remember seeing him later on as they tried to piece together the story. That's not really how our lives are led today. I think today the, the uh, analogous thing would be, oh, I saw somebody post something on social media, so I know what he did tonight, if you know what I mean. Um, I think the challenge that Vince Hallinan had in defending um, Egan was also something that attracted Jeff to the story. He was attracted to um, Hallinan's own personal narrative as someone who helped transform how justice happened in San Francisco, uh, not just in um, rooting out some of the corruption um, that was uh, commonplace in plaintiff cases where the railroads at the time would literally uh, pay off jurors to secure verdicts uh, so that they wouldn't have to pay personal injury cases. Hallinan was very involved with some other, um, I guess we would call them radical lawyers today to try to uh, create a system where you could have justice. And as a defense lawyer, he was willing as a young attorney to take on a relatively unpopular case. Uh, Egan was well liked, but the story had already disseminated pretty widely on uh, his likely guilt. And there were some other, I don't, I think the word shenanigans uh, sort of applies in this context where Egan, um, I, I think in effect feigned uh, mental health crisis and kind of disappeared from view as he was trying to figure out what he was going to do now that there was an arrest warrant out for him. And the story just, you can't make it up because it's got all these twists and turns. Um, Jeff, um, in addition to uh, his work as a public defender, and, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that uh, in a moment, um, I think he was committed to uh, stories and the telling of stories and the different media that you can use to give an account of something. And I think he learned as he explored different narratives, whether it was song or poetry, or he wrote a novel, um, or in this case, basically a, a historical account, or the movies that he made, whether they be documentary or um, uh, even uh, the last documentary worked on where there was more interviews with experts and, and uh, court watchers. Um, I think he, he, he took from those experiences things that he might be able to utilize in the courtroom. So even though you can look at this project and say, oh, he wrote a history of Egan or this time in the city, in a way he's, he's uh, excavating another way to try to be a better trial lawyer. And um, that's the way his brain worked, I think, with this kind of stuff. It always came back to his fundamental work. Um, he was uh, the hardest working lawyer, uh, trial attorney that I know. I think I'm a, a pretty good trial lawyer, uh, but Jeff uh, exceeded anything that I've ever done in terms of how hard he worked on a case. Partly it's, you know, different lawyers approach a case differently, but I'll just give you an example. Like during jury selection, uh, jury selection might take two or three days in a big uh, case, like a murder case. And um, attorneys get to get on their feet and during a process of voir dire, you ask 
prospective jurors questions. And uh, they might be stricken or released for cause. And then somebody from the audience will be put into the jury box and you'll get to ask some more questions. Jeff would memorize the names of the prospective jurors as they were being seated in the box so that when he stood up, I might have to look at a piece of paper and say, oh, um, Mr. or Ms. Con Conry or Conroy or, or, or Mr. Wilson or, or whatever the name is, Jeff wouldn't need anything in writing. He would stand up and say, you know, Mr. Gonzalez. And then he'd turn and say, well, Ms. Smith, do you agree with that? And then he'd jump to another person. That's the level of work because he wanted the jurors to know at the beginning that during the trial, as he tried to suggest the evidence was a particular way, they knew that he had worked harder than anybody else on the case. So if he was telling them some factual detail, they had a reason to believe that he had invested the time. And I don't know any other lawyer uh, that has, has done that. Um, with um, with uh, you know Jeff's uh, Jeff's legacy, of course, is um, impossible to really define because he touched so many different things. Uh, this book being an example of it. Um, in our own office, we've named a new initiative after Jeff. It's called the Adachi Project, and it's basically a media project that's going to include the making of kind of short what we'll call, uh, I think, uh, appropriately call documentary film to tell the stories of different aspects of the work we do. Uh, one of the films was released recently. It dealt with 111 Taylor Street, which of course is in the Tenderloin. And it was a film produced by an uh, uh, enterprise called Even Odd uh, Films. And they basically did a deep dive into one of the state's halfway houses for folks leaving uh, incarceration, uh, awaiting kind of uh, the hope of, you know, living in their own place and reentry programs and things like that. And it was a real expose into the fact that in the midst of COVID, the state run agency was not uh, following some pretty fundamental rules about cleanliness and, and uh, health um, uh, protocols and the like. And many of these um, formerly incarcerated people were facing being returned to incarceration if they spoke up too loudly about what was going on. And I think that this is the kind of project that um, really just underscores what Jeff cared about. It's, I think it, it honors his legacy. Uh, and when people hear about the project, those of us who obviously worked with Jeff or knew of him in the city when he was the public defender, people know exactly uh, whose, whose side the Adachi project is on. I'll just also add that the 111 Taylor Street project, or I'm sorry, the halfway house there is also the site of the Compton cafeteria riots, which are now being um, uh, seen historically as the origin, uh, uh, one of the origin stories along with Stone, Stonewall in New York as a transgender uh, rights battle um, that happened here on the West Coast. And so uh, our office, some of the folks in our office are working with city leaders to try to um, uh, create that as a historic uh, location. And I'm sure Katie and Alex, you both know about that. Um, are we, I think that's all I have to say. I don't know, Jakku, if there's something else you wanted to jump back to on the book, but thank you all for your interest in the book and in Jeff's uh, legacy. Thanks so much, Matt. Thanks, Jakku, and thank you, Matsuko, for being here and and, uh, and all saying a few words. Um, if uh, you're in the audience and you have some questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or um, there should be a Q&A button on the bottom ribbon of your Zoom window. Um, but uh, before we, we get into a bit of discussion, uh, we'd like to show one of Jeff's films, one of his short films called The Ride, um, that was uh, 
uh, came out in 2017 and was part of a longer feature length film called Defender. And uh, in the ride, uh, Jeff is representing a, a young man, Michael Scott, an African-American man who's charged with assaulting um, a police officer after being falsely accused of a crime, uh, Bart. Um, and if you're not familiar with Jeff's documentary work, we thought this was a great point of entry uh, you know, to get to get to know what he was about. And uh, as, as Jackie mentioned earlier on in the event, you know, he was often trying to show the, the criminal injustice system. And I think this, uh, this short film is very much a case, uh, case study uh, in that. Um, so we'll screen the ride. Now, if you're watching uh, this event after the fact, um, uh, we're going to skip ahead to the Q&A. And if you would like to see the ride, check out the ride film.org uh, for more information. Uh, there's a lot of great resources there. So um, the film is about 15 minutes and uh, we're going to screen it right now. Welcome back everyone. I know I'm feeling emotional after that documentary. Um, Jeff's commitment to his client and to social justice is just incredible and really comes through in just 15 minutes. Um, so we're gonna move to a Q&A portion. Um, we have a few questions for the panelists and then we will take some questions from the audience. Um, so just, you know, whichever, whoever would like to answer, please feel free or we'd love to hear from all of you as well. Um, so just getting started here. Um, what are some thematic through lines between Adachi's Frank Egan project and his work focused on more contemporary events such as the ride that we just watched. Well, yeah, and I also want to say that uh, for folks who do want a copy of the book, they should go to Grizzly Peak Press. You can get a copy for $18.95. It's an amazing book to, to read. It's just another example of uh, the works of, of Jeff Adachi. Um, you know, what's, what's amazing about Jeff is he was always teaching and educating. Um, you know, his first couple of movies, The Slanted Screen and, uh, you know, the Jack Sue story uh, dealt with stereotypes of Asian Americans in film. Uh, then he uh, came out with The Ride and The Defender, which dealt with criminal and justice systems with the Michael Smith case, a black man, um, you know, brutalized by the police there. The police aren't charged with anything yet. His client is charged with a misdemeanor. And then there's an immigration case that is covered um, additionally, Jeff had a, a, another movie called Racial Facial, uh, which was shown to a lot of high school students and it chronicled um, his parents were uh, incarcerated or uh, interned in the internment camps, uh, I believe during World War II, uh, and that have a head, had a heavy impact on Jeff. Um, but he covered the, you know, the uh, atrocities committed against Native Americans, against Asian Americans, against Muslim Americans, Etc. He covered it uh, in, in racial facial. And then another amazing movie, um, Ricochet, which is uh, chronicling uh, Matt Gonzalez's Garcia Zarate case, uh, which was at Canfis recently and won the audience uh, award, um, covered, uh, you know, um, a, a case. And, and, and Jeff was growing uh, throughout these his movies and covering different aspects of the criminal, uh, you know, injustice system but he was always teaching. In addition to that, Jeff had um, some uh, shows. It was there, you can find them on YouTube. If you, I think it's Justice Matters. There's like six parts. One covers bail, one covers race, et cetera. Um, you know, and so uh, he was doing that. Um, you know, additionally, as Mutsuko mentioned, he wrote numerous books. So the, the, the point is, is it, it, yes, he was a Renaissance man, um, but if you saw him in the courtroom as well, uh, you would, you know, put him along the same lines of any of the, the best trial attorneys uh, that there are out there as well. Um, just a true advocate. I was truly blessed and fortunate to see him in, in the courtroom. Um, so again, the, you know, the parallels that, you know, I, I, I like to see is that Jeff was always covering um, uh, issues that were relevant to criminal justice, for example, race body-worn camera footage, uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, 
you know, the, the Michael Smith case, the, the ride, uh, you know, was like one of the first ones where body worn camera footage was used in, uh, you know, San Francisco trials. So that's, that's what I'd say. I'll just um, take a stab at that. I mean, I think it's a, it's a really great question. Um, I don't think that there is a direct thematic um, through line between these two um, media endeavors. Um, although um, I think there is, if you consider that a deep dive into something factual reveals other narratives or another way of looking at the story. In the ride, I mean, we see that the way the police were ready to uh, portray these events were false. And uh, Jeff was able to show that. I think with Frank Egan, it's just incredible that that's a story that, uh, you know, nearly a hundred years later uh, had not really been uh, fleshed out uh, for contemporary audiences. If you weren't covering it in the daily papers, you were missing out on it. And so I think Jeff's fascination is the through line arguably is like facts matter, the detail matters, um, something like that. Thank you. Um, how has the Egan episode, mytholo how has it been mythologized in the contemporary public defender's office, if it has been? Um, and has Jeff's book kind of confirmed or complicated that institutional history? Um, and why, why was telling this story important to Jeff? Well, I'll take a stab at that. I don't think um, it's particularly changed how people viewed it within our office. I think most people in our office may not even have known uh, much about the story. There's a photograph of uh, uh, Frank Egan and some other former public defenders in the hallway here of our office, uh, Kathy Asada, who was on the call or on our uh, one of the participants uh, is responsible for getting that done. And so we both have to honor just the truth of our history. And as Jakub pointed out, Frank Egan was someone that deserved the respect and the accolades that he got. He was committed at one time in his life to the things that, that many public defenders believe in. That doesn't mean that that extended all the way uh, to you know the the uh, acts of conspiring with you know uh, others to commit a murder, um, and so you know I think as public defenders we are probably a little less judgmental than most uh, folks out there because um, we're used to reading police reports that make somebody look really awful and in going and meeting the sweetest, kindest person in a matter of minutes, you realize, okay, something's wrong here. Uh, what's going on? And when you've seen that happen a hundred times or more, you just learn how to, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, be, be perhaps less judgmental. Jaku, what would you say uh, to that question? Yeah. Um, I, I learned about the, the case because as, as uh, is evident now, uh, Jeff was a, a history buff. So um, at one of the uh, meetings we had in the office, he, he talked about the, the case and the history. Um, and, uh, you know, Jeff loved history and he loved the history of the office. And he was looking so forward to this year, the 100 year anniversary of the office. I mean, that was a huge deal to him. Uh, it meant so much to him. And it was in part because of the history of the office, the office that he helped continue the legacy on uh, and continues to thrive today with Mano Raju um, is the, the public defender. Um, but Jeff, you know, played such a critical role in that history and making the, you know, office the for, foremost and preeminent uh, public defender office in the nation, in my opinion. Um, and so, you know, I learned about the case through Jeff. If it had not been for him, um, we, you know, yeah, I'm sure something would have came up about, you know, the, the names of the, the public defenders, um, but you don't, a lot of the other names don't stick out, not that they were memorable men. Um, they, they were, there's been no woman yet, um, but uh, that's another topic for another day. 
Wait, wait, what did you say, Jakku? There's been no women uh, public defenders yet. In Kamiko Burton. Kamiko, okay, got it, I got it. Okay, well. Um, and correct that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No elected. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're coming up seven o'clock now. So uh, we have a couple audience questions. So maybe um, I'll, I'll ask one or two and then we'll take uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Matt, when you were talking about Egan, uh, you know, Egan up to shenanigans uh, in throughout that episode, uh, it made me think a lot about, you know, the, the incredible kind of trust and leniency around, around Egan's, uh, you know, the whole, the whole affair really. And then watching, you know, the Michael Smith, uh, case, uh, it's just such a stark, stark contrast yet, you know, the Adachi's book seems really careful not to draw any conclusions, uh, but rather present, you know, present a case uh, in full. What, what can we learn about achieving justice in spite of flaws in the justice system from the Frank Egan case? I think it's a very, it's a very difficult um, story because as Jakku alluded to, um, as you read the book and you see the police do this fantastic detective work, to zero in on Egan. It turns out that they already had reason to believe Egan might be plotting the murder of this particular woman. And that was the result of a wiretap that they had illegally uh, set up uh, where they were eavesdropping, I believe on some kind of medical uh, doctor who was known to help uh, what we'll call, you know, underworld figures who might be shot or injured and he would render aid so they wouldn't have to go to a hospital and be subject to detection by law enforcement. And so they were very interested in stopping that. And Egan happened to be a friend of that doctor or happened to be in his office. And by chance, they overheard this wiretap about his interest in committing this crime. At a, some later time, they also picked up his decision to abandon the plan, um, but they, they believe he would carry it out. And so, you know, when you have a, a criminal justice story that begins with, you know, this sort of illegality by law enforcement, you know, as a human being, we can all appreciate that hey, you're, you, know, you don't want murders to happen or these things to take place, but th there is a justice story embedded in, in the Egan story, which never fully gets played out because by the time it's discovered that this had taken place, Egan had uh, not suffered the death penalty. And so he and Hallinan were reluctant to try to get a new trial because they didn't want to have to face a punishment like that. So it's just a super complicated story. Um, you, uh, you know, we've talked quite a bit about the wiretapping, but uh, both the ride, uh, you know, both the ride and the Frank Egan story involve these nascent technologies, right? These, these sort of new options that I, the justice system maybe isn't even comfortable, comfortable with. Um, why is it why is it important to maybe scrutinize moments where new technology are impacting our justice system? Uh, if these two episodes have anything in common or are dissimilar, you know, you can speak to that. But uh, and Jaku, you mentioned quite a bit about discovery earlier. But um, why is this an important why you know why are both important case studies for for public defenders? Well, I'll just say, and I now turn it over to Jakku, I don't know about a comparison between the technology, but certainly our contemporary world has changed because of body-worn camera. For years, attorneys like Jakku and myself and Jeff had to go to court and convince a jury that the police might not be telling the truth about something. Now, that's often captured on video 
And it's a much different enterprise to uh, get the truth told. And I'm not, I don't, certainly not suggesting law enforcement are the only people getting caught by video or that all police officers have a problem, but uh, certainly the George Floyd event and others like it have, have, have taught us and changed our, our, our way of life as a result of the truth that technology has brought us. Jaku? Yeah, I, and I just add, you know, it's, you know, what we should always be, be mindful of is, is that with the eavesdropping device, that was used back then uh, in, in modern day time, they had other devices such as Stingray devices, which um, you know, the public, when they learn about that they're being surveyed uh, in those manners, uh, there's outrage and those um, are then excluded and, and outlawed in, in many states and countries. Um, and for example, in this book here, um, the eavesdropping device was outlawed in many states. Likewise, um, the Stingray devices, which capture cell phone information and cell tower information without a warrant uh, have been found illegal in many states. Um, and so it, it, I don't think it's an issue of, I think they're, they're different because in each, in, in the eavesdropping thing, that was a clandestine device in the same way with the, 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 uh, the Stingray device. With the body worn camera, you know, that's the law and, and the officers are supposed to have that on uh, and it's there to protect us all. Cool. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, looking into the audience Q and A, most of the questions uh, seem to be about where where can folks screen the full Defender film, uh, and also where they can screen Ricochet. I know Ricochet just screened at Cam a couple Saturdays ago, uh, and I don't. I'm not sure personally if there's uh, a next screening set up. It was fantastic. Congrats to you all. It's very uh, impressive and, and moving. Um, and the same co-director, right? Uh, or the, um, who? Yeah, Chihiro, Chihiro Wimbush uh, co-directed Ricochet and he's credited on this as uh, doing a lot of the editing of, of the film. And I don't know if he's a co-producer, but he, he had a number of, I saw his name in the credits. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if if, uh, if if any of you uh, happen to to know when the next screening is, um, you know, feel, you can pipe up or drop it in the chat. But uh, yeah, maybe uh, if no, if there aren't any other questions, uh, we can end on um, uh, we can end on. Uh, I, I mean, I was just after seeing Ricochet and then seeing his. Uh, seeing the ride and and uh, you know how intertwined Jeff's work and trial work was uh, with with media, you know, with documentary. Um, to any of you, maybe maybe Matt, you would uh, know this best. But uh, is there a special responsibility for a person who works uh, as a public defender and also performs journalism? Well. Uh, did he have any code of like journalistic ethics that seemed tailored to uh, his particular very singular kind of place? Well, that's a great question. I don't know how to answer that. I mean, I do think that Jeff had the foresight to see the power of not just uh, trying to tell the story in the old school newspaper, but putting a, putting a film out there. And, you know, there's the, um, the film that was made, he was actually one of the main protagonists in it. Um, uh, Jaku, what's the title of the old uh, film from the late 90s, 2000, what was that? Um, Beyond a Reasonable Doubt, are you talking about that one? Yeah, no, no, uh, Presumed. Uh, Presumed Guilty. Guilty. Presumed Guilty was a documentary that featured Jeff working on a case. And I think probably he was inspired to keep making other films because invariably we would meet young attorneys who would say, I went to law school after seeing that film. Like I wanted to be a lawyer. And I think these films do inspire, you know, uh, just seeing that footage of Jeff out there, um, you know, it's a real thing. Here you are, you're, 
you're going to pick up your client, then you're rushing back to the office to finish a motion. You're dealing with a judge that doesn't want you to win. I mean, there's no even polite way of saying it. You know, uh, you know, Jeff's client's asking like, well, why won't the judge allow it? And Jeff's like, you know, because it's going to help you. I mean, it's really that simple. And and um, as we amplify these uh, these realities, hopefully, um, you know, jurors can uh, make up for it because they know that, you know, a lot of jurors walk into court, they see a judge in a black robe, they think you're getting the fair treatment. They have no idea that, you know, it's been popularized by TV shows that somehow confessions are not admitted into evidence. The truth is often the other way around. The misconduct of prosecutorial witnesses or evidence that you want to introduce isn't being allowed in. Jakku? No, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Cool. Well, um, is this maybe a, a good place to stop? I, I know we've had a bunch of questions about where, where we can screen, <laughs> where folks can screen The Full Defender and Ricochet. Uh, Mitsuko added a, a link to the film's um, website in the chat. It's, it's just hitting the festival circuit. I think Cam was the very first screening, right? Um, and I'm also going to drop a link in there to uh, wearedefender.com, um, which is, uh, would you describe it as kind of like an online journal of sorts, publication of the Adachi? I, I think, that, yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. Um, cool. Katie? Yeah, thank um, you so much to all of our panelists. This was an incredible event. Um, and yeah, keep following the Tenderland Museum because I think it, we, we would love to screen more of Jeff's films in the future as well. So let's, thank you uh, all. Let's do it again soon. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you so much. Great seeing you. And thank you for having us. And thank you, Mr. Co. as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. everyone. All right, everyone, have a lovely evening. We'll see you soon. Thank <laughs> you.